If you have your Bibles this morning, let me encourage you to turn to the book of Philippians. Imagine that. Your Bibles. Anybody a Bible fall open to the book of Philippians yet? <laughs> Mine does. Um, but we've been talking about this whole thing of keys to joy in the Christian life. And we've been through a lot of them. This is actually number 12. And so we've talked about a lot of things in this series so far. Some of what we're going to talk about today in, in, in captures or encapsulates some of those previous points as well. But what this passage talks about is making sure that we follow the right models if we want to have joy in the Christian life. Follow the right models. That's why that video struck me of, I need to follow Jesus. But what does that mean? And we'll look at that in just a little bit. So if you have your Bibles open, let me encourage you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Uh, we're just going to read a few verses and then you'll be seated for a lot longer than you want to be. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we need to hear from you more than anything I have to say. So speak clearly and help us to listen in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in, in this passage, Paul has just come out of talking about where we were at last week when we were talking about one of the keys to joy in the Christian life is not falling into apathy or not becoming dispassionate in our walk with Christ. It's easy sometimes when we look at the grace side of things to say we are saved by grace through faith. Here's a question. How much does God know? That Surely there's a few more people that know that. How much does God know? Everybody. When does God know it? So that when we confess our sin, which means to agree with God about our sin, by the way, we're not informing him. We're agreeing with him about our sin. When we confess our sin and turn away from our sin and place our faith in what Jesus accomplished for us, when God says our sins are forgiven, it's all the sin God knows about. How much sin does God know about? When does he know it? All the time. So that when he says you're forgiven, one of the reasons that we stand on the promise that eternal life is eternal is because we know we've been forgiven of it all. But if we're not careful, that can create in us a sense of sitting back and becoming passive and saying, okay, well, if it's all forgiven and, and it doesn't matter what I do, God already knew about it, I'm okay. It's really easy to fall into that idea, well, well it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. The problem is, Paul said in that passage, don't fall into that trap because that does not bring joy in the Christian life. How many, just quick non-scientific poll. How many of you have ever read something in a Bible that you feel like God had just for you for that day? It jumped off the page and in that moment you felt joy of knowing God just spoke to you. Yeah, see, you don't get that if you've fallen into apathy and you don't care. Because when you fall into apathy, the first thing that usually goes is participation. 
participation in church, participation serving in ministry, serving one another, that kind of, and then it works its way back until we find ourselves even to the point of we can't remember the last time we cracked our Bible except for when the pastor said, open your Bible. It's kind of like when I was in South Dakota, I was, I didn't know anything about pastoring. Some of y'all would say I haven't grown much, but all I knew to do was knock on doors. And I knocked on every door in the town that we lived in. I mean, that's, that's just what I knew to do. So this guy came to the door and, uh, and we were talking and he, he was telling me all about how he loved going to Huron Baptist Church. And he mentioned the pastor's name and that was like three before me. And he's talking about how, you know, praise Jesus and, and Holy Spirit this and God that and Father and all this stuff. And normally I kind of know when I meet people in that setting, the more of that I hear, the less of something else I'm going to hear. And so we're having this conversation and he engaged me in this debate. And, you know, I was straight out of the military into ministry. I didn't know, come here from Sikkim. And uh, so he asked me a question and I said, well, I don't have a Bible with me. You have one. And so he tells his son, he says, go, go get that. Go, go get our Bible off the coffee table. And the kid goes off and comes back and he goes, what, what, what book? He said, you know that one we read every night. So he brought the TV guide. Oh. <laughs> um, some of y'all don't remember what a TV guide well, see, used to, you had to, anyway, I'll explain it to you later. <laughs> and so what had happened probably is, while he might have used to have been in church, that worked its way back into his personal life and personal connection with the Lord. You know, it's real hard to have joy in your Christian walk when you're disconnected from its source. Just say it. And what happens is, and some of you have been there, you know what it's like, right? You first start missing church and you miss church, right? The longer it goes, though, the less you miss. And now it actually gets harder and harder to come back. Anybody been there? Like, I'm not raising my hand. People are looking. So Paul has just come out of that idea of don't fall into apathy. Don't fall. If you want to join the Christian life, don't, don't, don't fall into that pattern. And he, and so he goes from there to say, join in following my example. Notice if you have your Bible still open, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. In us. Now, to be fair, what Paul is saying is, as I am following Jesus, if you'll follow me, guess where you'll be headed? Right? See, if I'm I'm running after Jesus with all my heart, and you're following me, where are we both going to get to? So Paul wasn't saying, I'm perfect, because we just heard him say earlier in chapter 3, I'm not there yet. I haven't made it. So he's not bragging on himself. When he says us, think about the examples he's given earlier in the text. In chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, you remember those famous verses? Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. The right model, Jesus, selfless, humble, sacrificial service. Those are all parts of this passage that we unpacked a few weeks ago. If you need to be refreshed on that, go to our website or go to our Facebook page and you can kind of see that in weeks past. But then there's also the example he had just given in chapter 2 verses 19 through 24 of Timothy. When he says us, this is the us that he's worked his way through getting to our passage. Listen to what he said about Timothy. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. 
But you know of his proven worth that he served me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. What did he say about Timothy? Proven character, consistent service, genuine concern. That's the model that Paul is talking about when he says us. And then he goes on from there to talk about Epaphroditus in verses 25 through following. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who's also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you'd heard he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I've sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Epaphroditus, heartfelt concern for others, sacrificial perseverance, even though it got him close to the point of death. That is the us that... Paul is talking about in the passage we have today. We won't read all the verses, but we just spent time of the last couple of weeks reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 16, where we read of Paul and his dogged devotion to Christ, the faith that he showed, the grace he extended to others, and his others-centeredness. It's that that Paul says, join together to become imitators of me. He's not saying join me in becoming an imitator, but you all come together. Now, here's here's why that's so important. You You may not get this, but here's why it's so important. Because what's he been calling for in this whole letter that brings joy in the Christian life? Unity in church. Unity in church. And so what he's saying is, there's this goal we have of wanting to get to Jesus, and I'm following with all my heart. If you will come together, and if you'll walk together, you'll find that joy. You see that? You see that in the passage when he says... Join together and imitate. So it's it's them following Paul who's following Jesus. Keep in mind, they didn't have a Bible. There was no Bible for them to have yet. Paul came with Jesus' message. So when he was saying, follow me, he was saying, these are the things I've been taught. So let's walk them together. Why do we need to focus on the right models? Because what you focus on is where you go. I heard a story one time about a little girl whose daddy was wanting to teach her how to ride a bicycle. Anybody been there? There's no bike riders? Okay, one or two. All right, so so the child, this, this, this little girl, she's about six years old, and she was convinced she could not ride a bike. And she, every time her daddy would bring it up, she would just cry. He bought her a brand new shiny bike, you know, with the little pink things hanging off the handlebars and the, and the, the reflectors and the pads all over the place and, and all that. And he, he thought, that, surely that will get her motivated. But she was just convinced she couldn't ride a bike. So he decided, I know what I'll do. I'll take her out to the amusement park parking lot. It was the off season. It wasn't like there was a lot of traffic out there. And she had literally miles of parking lot to learn to ride in. He finally talked her into getting on the bike and she got on the bike and you know how that goes, right? Hang on, hang on to the handlebars and I'm going to run behind you. Remember that? And the whole time he's running behind her, she's going, daddy, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. He's going, sure, you're going to do this. You're going to be a great bike rider. This is going to be fun. When you learn how to ride a bike, you're going to realize it opens up whole new avenues for you. You can go anywhere you want to go. You can go be with friends. You can do, you can go travel all across town because it was back a hundred years ago when you could still do that. And so she's convinced the whole time. She's going, dad, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And they're like, why can't you do this? I can't do this. In the middle of this parking lot was a single pole. She said, dad, I'm going to hit the pole. And he said, Look at the whole parking lot. Just go ride your bike. He's running. By this point, he's really hoping, and his prayer life is getting better because he's thinking if she doesn't start pedaling soon, it's going to be over. 
And so he's running behind and he just kind of lets go and just starts running with her. And she's pedaling and she's staying there. And the whole time she's just, now she's crying. She's saying, dad, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do it. I can't ride a bike. I'm going to hit the pole. I can't ride a bike. I'm going to hit the pole. Sure enough, she rode straight for that pole. <laughs> fell off the bike and said, daddy, I told you I couldn't ride a bike. Why'd she hit the pole? Because that's what she was focused on. That's why many of us grow up thinking, you know what? I had such a terrible home life that I'm never going to be like my parents. But it ends up being what we focus on our whole life. And so rather we, many times we think that's who I'm not going to be, that's who I end up being. Because I didn't look at different models I continue to look at that model. And so Paul says, join in following my example. Be co-fellow imitators of me. And he goes on to say, look at verse 18, for, he's going to shift gears. Why do you need to follow right models? Because there's some wrong models. And I apologize about the colors on that, uh, but hopefully we'll get it together. He says, look at verse 18. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, to be clear, in this context, what is Paul talking about? How many of you have ever attempted to share your faith and been shut down by somebody who is angry and hates what you stand for? Yeah, this is not that. Okay, let's just be clear. The enemies of the cross of Christ he's talking about here are not the enemies of Christ. They're the enemies of the cross. Now, what does it mean to be an enemy of the cross? They're people who say salvation by grace through faith is too easy and too cheap. If you're not going to follow a whole bunch of rules, and if you're not going to follow this restricted life, if you're not going to earn your way into God's good grace, you're not trying hard enough, and you don't deserve to go to heaven. See, it was the group, we know the Pharisees, one of the problems they had with Jesus was he came along saying, God can be your father, and you can be forgiven. And they, kind of like the, the depiction of the older man on the video, they're sitting back and saying, no, that's not the way it goes. I've got this whole list of things you can't do if you're going to follow Jesus, right? How many of you remember some of these from earlier life? Don't go to movies. Don't, go, don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't chew. Don't dance. Don't play cards. I'm sure there's a bunch more I'm missing. See, the problem with those lists, and I know I say this all the time, you're probably sick of hearing me saying it is, the problem is, who gets to make the list? The person that makes lists usually makes a list of things they don't struggle with. Right? God would never save anything who does what you do. He saves people who do, who do what I do. You know another problem with the list? Not only do we, not only does the person that make the list make it the things they don't struggle with, but if there was a list that could somehow earn our way to God, it couldn't be much of a list or he couldn't be much of a God. Yeah, if we can somehow bring God down to us. Really what we're talking about when we're talking about being an enemy of the cross and being, an, being against the idea of grace is we're wanting to pull God down to our level and make him someone we can achieve, we can earn, we can obligate. Because we did X, Y, Z, he then is required to do A, B, C, or he's not God. 
the God of this Bible is bigger than that. Can you imagine? All you have to do is climb the ladder to get to God. How big a ladder must that be? See, that's the way all the other world religions work. Follow the five pillars of Islam. And as long as Allah's having a good day that day when you die, you might make it to paradise. Unless, of course, you're a woman because there's no, that's not for you. Climb the mountain, get to the guru. That's, that's the idea. Every other world religion is based on how can I get to a version of God. And Christianity, God says, child, you wouldn't even climb onto the first rung of the ladder, let alone get all the way up to me. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come down to you and pick you up and carry you to where I am. So these, these enemies of the cross, they're saying... You Christians are not doing, you're not following the rules. You're not doing the stuff. And if you're not going to do the stuff, then there's no way you're ever going to get to God. It's just too easy. He goes on to describe them, and the descriptions he gives all apply to that description. Listen to what he says. First of all, he says, whose end is destruction. Because if you're trying to climb that ladder to get to God, you're going to climb up, whether it's the first rung or the second rung, but you're eventually going to get tired of climbing and you're going to fall off. And when you fall off and you don't get there, what is the end? If we follow Scripture, it talks about when Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man who had not placed his faith in Jesus ended up in Hades or the grave only to come out of there one day in the resurrection to stand before the great white throne judgment and then to be cast from there into hell. That's what happens to everybody who tries to make it to God on their own and fails. And everybody who tries to make it on their own, not going through the cross, not accepting the sacrifice that Jesus made, that is their only end. And by the way, I, I posted this on social media this last week, um, and, I, and I truly believe it. Hell, let's just be clear, is not the end of being. It's just the end of well-being. Because a resurrected body is eternal. And it's either going to be eternally with God or eternally separated from him. Lazarus goes, dies, goes to Abraham's bosom. He also will come out of that into a resurrection and stand before the Bema seat of Christ where his actions will be judged and what he did that stood for Christ will be rewarded and he will pass from there into a new heaven and a new earth where he will live forever in the presence of God. See, when you try to climb the ladder, you're going to fall off. But when God comes to get you and carries you up the ladder, you're going to make it every single time. So their end is destruction because they decided that the cross was too easy. The cross didn't matter. And by the way, Old Testament says anyone who's ever been hung on a tree is cursed of God. So how could that Savior save you? They also, he also said, whose God is their appetite. What is their focus? They're looking at that pole in the middle of the parking lot, and that's what they're aimed at. While Paul gloried in Christ, they gloried in what they could get or what they have. Can you imagine... Can you imagine this conversation? God, I have a million dollars. You got to let me in. God says, um, 
I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And I own the hills. And I own the earth. And I own the universe. You have what? Well, God, you don't understand. I have this amazing gift that could really benefit the church. Surely that should be good enough. What did God tell Moses? Who made man's mouth? What does Deuteronomy 8.18 say? It's I who give you strength to make wealth. If we read the story of the building of the tabernacle, God was the one that put it into the workers to be able to have the skill to do the building. God says, really? See, you have this great talent or this great skill that you think I need. I spoke and the universe came into existence. Really? But God, I'm influential. People love me. Uh, not me, I mean, this, the person saying this. If you just let me in, I'll bring lots of people with me because they'll just blindly follow me. And God says, you know what? Narrow is the way that leads to salvation and broad is the path that leads to destruction. I don't need anyone to follow you I need them to follow me. And the only way you follow him is through surrender, confession, and repentance. So they're focused on what they can get. Now, I think there's a play there that says their God is their appetite. Um, the, the original language there says, mentions stomachs. And so that probably has a saying into, you know, following the dietary law and that sort of stuff. But he goes on from that to say, whose glory is in their shame. Isaiah chapter 5 or 20 says, woe to the nation who calls good evil and evil good. They glory in their shame. The things they should be ashamed of are the things that they put out all over social media, the things they put out on the, on the news, the thing that they send in emails and email blasts, and the things they want everybody to not just tolerate but celebrate. We ought to realize they're in, recognize their focus, and repudiate their morals because they've gotten it backwards. Think about it. Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that? Genesis chapter 19. God destroyed them. We love to poke fun at and point the finger at Sodom and Gomorrah, don't we? Shame on them. They should have known. Well, I don't know. Go up to Judges chapter 19 and Gibeah of Benjamin. Guess what? Same deal. And they were Israelites, follow, supposed to be followers of God. And if we're not careful, if we're watching those models and if we're glorifying those models, we'll find ourselves compromising on some of the same standards we once stood firm on. And by the way, again, remember the list? Remember the list? We'll say shame on anyone who does the things that bother me. While at the same time saying, God, I hope you give me credit for the thing, my intentions to do the things that I want, that I'm trying to do. You know, we, we need to quit making levels of sin. We do. For John 4 says, all sin is lawlessness. Any sin is a violation of the holiness and righteousness of God. And we just got through studying this, this week in our class, James 4, 17, it says, the good a man know he ought to do and do it not to him that is sin. So we don't even have to do anything to sin. We can just not do what we know we should. The difference between the hypocrite who says, who wants everyone to think they're following Jesus while they're living a life of sin, and the believer who really wants to live for Jesus and is struggling against temptation and losing the battle here and there and trying to walk. The difference between the two is what your focus is. You see, the believer has an operating system that says 
do right. But there's some bugs in that code that caused them to do wrong. The person who's not yet a follower of Jesus, their operating system says, do wrong. And there's some bugs in their code too because occasionally they get it right. The difference here between what he's talking about here and that is these are people who celebrate their sin. And lastly, the wrong models, we need to reject their worldview because look what it says, who set their minds on earthly things. If you're living for the things that you can touch, see, hear, taste, and smell, can I, can I just let you in on a secret? One day you're going to leave all that behind. You know the old joke, I've never, heard, never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. If you go back to the tombs of the ancient pharaohs and, and, and other leaders around the world, you go back and you find these elaborate chambers that are built into these, these uh, mausoleums or the pyramids or whatever, and what you find is they had all these places to store their jewels and their gold and all this stuff that they were hoping that they were going to be resurrected. And when they were resurrected, they would be able to hold on to all that wealth they had accumulated. And you know what they found out years later when they finally got into those places? They were still dead. And it was gone. And even in the places where they found the treasure, they were still dead. So their focus was what Blaise Pascal called licking the earth. They wanted to seek those who seek to do what they want, when they want, how they want are those who are living for this world. And he jumps right from that to say, but that's not how it should be for us. We need to focus on the future for every follower of Jesus and realize heaven is home. For our citizenship, the word there is, comes from the same root word that we get politics from. For our citizenship is in heaven. And but just let's be clear. It's not die, go to heaven, that's it forever. Because listen just quickly to what Revelation chapter 21 has to say about that. Revelation chapter 20. I mentioned this earlier, but I want you to see it in the Bible because not everybody who has the name pastor um, will tell you the truth. Chapter 21 in Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Here's the verse we all know. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without costs. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So heaven is our home. But it's a heaven that's going to be experienced by living in the presence of God on a new creation unstained by sin. So we need to recognize that the reality, the focus that is the future of every follower of Jesus, the mark of citizenship is that heaven is home, that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Now, I know it's not popular in our day (coughs) to say that Jesus has to be Lord and Savior. But what happened when he called his disciples? He gave them one simple instruction. What was it? Follow me. Follow me. Guess what being Lord means? 
He's the leader. As much as I loved being the line leader in kindergarten, <laughs> Jesus saves those who surrender to his right to rule and reign in their lives. So, Jesus is Lord and Savior. That means that if he's Lord, we go where he goes. We do what he does. And one of the challenges this brings for us as we think about our future as followers of Jesus is sometimes God says, I'm going to change your schedule. Sometimes God says, I'm going to change your address. Sometimes God says, I'm going to change your inheritance. And sometimes God says, I'm going to change your audience. And when we find we find out in that moment whether he really is Lord. When God says, do something, it, he's not elbowing the angels in heaven going, watch how I mess with this one. He has a purpose that you can't see to accomplish something you can't do without those changes. That's the hardest part for many people. I like the idea of not going to hell. If I was asked my question, if I was asked a question this morning, how many of you want to go to heaven? Evidently just some of y'all. <laughs> yeah, just some of y'all. All right, so the, for those who are saying yes, I would like to go to heaven, of course we all want to go to heaven. I mean, how about if I said it this way? How many of you would like to go to hell, burn forever, but never get burned up, be in darkness so dark that it's physically painful, have worms chew on you, but never truly consume you, to be separated from God, no break, no vacation, no comfort. How many of you'd like that for your eternity? No hands, right? Of course we all want to go to heaven. Of course! The problem is, some of us just aren't willing to surrender. We want to try to make our own way. We want to try to do our own thing. We want to try to get there on our own. But the mark of a follower of Jesus is they follow Jesus. His glory is our future. Think about that for a moment. You remember when Jesus prayed? I, I'm going to finish up really quick, I promise. Remember when Jesus prayed? He said, Father, here's what I want for them. I want them to see the glory I had before I had to come down here with them. Remember that prayer, John 17? Imagine this. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's your future. That's your future. What did Paul say? The perishable body will be sown in the ground and what will be raised the imperishable we'll receive a body like his who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory the who there references back to the lord jesus christ lastly we need to realize that while the future of every follower of Jesus is heaven, is Jesus the Savior and Lord. His glory is our future. We need to realize His rule is now. And part of, part of surrendering to His rule is discipleship. Now I'm, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get messy with me here a little bit. So if it doesn't apply to you, don't worry about it. But discipleship doesn't just mean being discipled. It means discipling others, too. His rule is now. And here's the great thing. All those things about that future 
is true of every follower of Jesus. Can I just say this? There are no extras in God's movie. You know who extras are, right? They're all the people in the background that don't have their names listed in the credits. They get paid $100 to stand there and hold a piece of cake for like eight hours while they try to get the shot right. There's nobody like that in God's movie. When God saves you, he has a purpose for you. And that purpose that he has for you is when lived out will bring you the joy of knowing that your life matters for long past the few years we get to be here. So I guess that really just leaves us with one question. Which model are you following? Are you following the the sacrificial service, the, the humble, the humility, the perseverance of Paul, the genuine concern of Timothy, the faithfulness of Epaphroditus, the humility, humble service of Jesus? Or are you still trying to get there on your own? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you I know I say this all the time, God, but I mean it with my heart, my whole heart. Thank you for your word. We could never know you if it weren't for that. Not in a way that could make a difference in our lives other than just condemning us. God, I thank you that you care enough for us, that you give us instruction, you give us examples to follow. God, my prayer this morning is that as we've looked so deeply into this passage that we'd start with the right question and that is am I following Jesus? God, I know there's some people here in this room who are not. God, what I want more than anything is for people to quit trying to be happy, quit trying to find joy on their own, a joy that can't last and they would find their joy in you. I pray that today would be the day that you would draw them to yourself, give them a faith to believe, just like you've done for so many of us, so that they might begin to walk with you, following the right models. But God, I pray too, because I know there's some people in this room that maybe they started to follow you years ago, but for whatever reason, they... They've fallen back into apathy or passivity or distraction. Maybe it's because somebody who names your name was not very nice to them. Maybe it's because once they tried so hard and saw no fruit. Maybe, God, it's because they've fallen in with a crowd of people and they've begun following the wrong models and that has led them to distraction pray, God, that today would be the day that we'd be reminded of the models we have to follow and that you would have taken our eyes off of that path we've been walking and put us back on the path of walking with you. I pray, God, you give us courage to do some things different, not to earn your acceptance, but because we are. And then I pray too, God, because we have some people who are walking with you and running after you with all their heart and they're getting tired. And this joy that we talk about seems so far away from them because all they can focus on is how they're putting out so much effort with so little return. I pray, God, that you'd remind us of our future so that we find joy in our present and aren't distracted by our past. Father, I don't know who you've been speaking to, but I trust that you have. And I pray, God, that you'd give us the courage to take that first next step as you lead. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.